Welcome to this training session brought to you by the Society of American Archivists uh, of a Religious Collection section. My name is Mary Kenny. Um, we acknowledge that we live and work on the traditional lands of many indigenous nations. We know that indigenous peoples have suffered from historical and on, in, ongoing injustices and understand as an archival organization that we must work towards sharing historical truths and renew respectful relationships with indigenous communities. We respect the longstanding relationships that indigenous nations have to this land as the original caretakers. We are grateful for their stewardship and protection of the water and earth. We pay our respects to elders past and present. Today's topic is archival arrangement for beginners. Before I present our, our before I introduce our presenter, let's review the disclaimer. The content in these presentations is for information only and is not legal advice. Our views do not represent the organizations where we work. We do not make any endorsements or guarantees. We are not liable for any loss or damage caused by your use of the content we provide. It is your responsibility to critically evaluate the content provided in the presentation or the accompanying materials, adapted from the Los Angeles Preservation Network and Original Order. Also, please remember the points shown on this slide. You will not be able to use your microphone or video during the session. You can click on the closed captioning button um, of your screen and underline live transcript. Click enable auto transcription to get closed captioning. There will be a question period after the presentation concludes. You should use the Q and A button feature to ask your questions. We will not answer questions in the chat or unmuted attendees due to time constraints. Please be respectful in your interactions. We expect you to follow the SAA code of conduct, whose link is contained. This session will be recorded. Please fill out the short survey after the session ends. We do encourage you to join the Society of American Archivists if you are not a member. We thank the Congregation of the Sisters of St. Joseph in Canada for hosting this webinar. And now I would like to introduce our presenter. Samantha Thompson is presently Senior Archivist for the Region of Peel in Ontario, Canada. The Region of Peel Archives is a local history and government archives serving a large and complex second tier municipality slated for dissolution in May 2025. There, Samantha has worn all the archival hats from reference work to collections management to exhibit planning in collaboration with the Regional Museum and Art Gallery. She also works closely with the records management and privacy divisions of the region. One of her primary interests is the defense of the archival mission in times of increasing disaffection and uncertainty. Samantha once did a PhD in philosophy, which means that she thinks too much about the meaning of everything for her own good. Before training later in life to become an archivist, she occupied various roles in academia and the arts. Samantha? I'm almost ready here. There we go. I just uh begin by um, telling you literally where I'm coming from. Um, so I uh, I have been for the last nine years at the Region Appeal Archives, um, which you heard is a local history and government archives. Um, and we're just west of Toronto. We occupy the first floor of the old county jail, which you can see there. Um, we are, uh, we have a population of about 1.5 million people that we serve. In two, including two of Canada's largest cities. And uh, we operate on what, what we in Canada call the total archives model, which you may have heard of. Um, that means with, that we collect both uh, government and non-government records uh, related to our geographical area. 
And the advantage of that, um, from my point of view, um, is that I've seen every type of collection there is to see, really, from from personal archives of you know housewives to uh, large organizations, including governments, um, every kind of organization from volunteer groups to um, businesses. And we also um, I collect lots of records from ordinary people, which is an emphasis you don't you didn't used to see so much in, in universities, um, though that is changing. But we really are the archives of the ordinary, the fabric of ordinary life. And some, you know, one of the disadvantages, if you could call it that, we're part of a large corporation um, with a lot of competing um, priorities, including extremely essential services. So I, I know what it's like to um, contribute this profession in a very tight, um, tightly resourced situation. My team there, um, that was largely my team until recently, um, I, without whom I would be nothing. We, we look a little more fresh face there than we do now. That was a few years ago. We call that our band shot. And uh, as for me, I'm, um, I'm a second career archivist, so I've never quite stopped feeling um, a bit like a, an interloper. Um, I keep wondering when I'll feel like a real archivist. So it's a bit amusing to be asked for uh, my, my pearls of wisdom on this topic. I'm, I'm still very much learning, but I think that's that's probably kind of an essential part of the profession is every collection you approach is, is, is you're, you're kind of a beginner again, and we, we will get to that. So the, the couple of goals of this webinar, um, the first one is simply to introduce what I'm calling uh, the messy middle of archival processing. So you're taking those what I call raw records, the way they come into you as an archivist, and you're transforming them into something usable. And uh, it's arguably the kind of uh, the critical part of, of the job. And uh, therefore, um, the most intimidating, probably. And it doesn't get um, maybe as much attention from, from stakeholders and decision makers because people don't see it. They see the fruits of it in those nice clean folders and boxes and your descriptions, your archival descriptions, but they don't see what goes into that. And you know, when people teach about arrangement, it's the same thing. It's, it's hard to talk about it in the abstract um, because it's not abstract. It's, it's a very physical um, activity as we'll see. So we'll be getting into the some of the, an overview of what that involves, but it is very difficult to teach um, sort of without stuff in front of you, but I'll do my best. And the second thing I wanted to do is just to convey some of the things I wish I'd known when I started out. Um, I still remember facing my first collection. It was about a meter of stuff and just all crammed in boxes from the donor. And I thought, what the heck am I supposed to do? Where do I start? And some of it sounds pretty basic, but you know, I still forget <laughs> to do some of those steps. So I'm hoping that gives you a bit of an orientation um, if you're new or if you're not new. What you won't get is um, any decisive statements about arrangement. I'm, I'm a working archivist. I haven't written a uh, academic paper on archival theory ever. And uh, you know, I'm not an archival luminary. And you also won't get a, a kind of recipe where if you apply it, everything will, you know, it would turn out the same for everyone. Um, every collection is different and every archivist, it's fair to say, will would not come up with exactly the same description or, or arrangement and therefore description. So what we're gonna do, this is the way things are gonna unfold, uh, hopefully. Um, we're gonna start out with a bit of background and theory as a kind of what, and why of arrangement. And then we're gonna look at some practical stuff. So um, how to do it and so far as, as you can kind of do that on a webinar. And now I'm just going to summarize the things that I, I uh, wish I had known earlier that I would like to pass along. And then if we have time, uh, we will talk about some kind of edge cases where um, go a little bit beyond what we've covered in the webinar, but very quickly, nothing um, that will solve all your problems, but just places to go. And then some Q&A. So the bulk will be in the, the yellow and the green bits, um, and then the blue and the pink is sort of um, bonus material, which hopefully we'll get to. So let's start with a bit of theory. I'm not, not too, you know, um, it's a bit of false advertising, because I, I said we were going to 
this is going to be what you don't learn in school. And this is definitely things that you would learn in school if you if you went to school for archives. Um, there, there are things to keep in mind um, when you get sort of, um, you know, uh, stymied maybe in the middle of a collection. It's, it's good to think about why am I doing this and think back to the basics. So let's start with, um, and, and I'm going to orient, you know, all this theoretical stuff to, to what's at hand here, which is arrangement. It's not going to be exhaustive again, but an archives or a font, as we like to say in Canada, um, I, I hear that word is not so much in vogue in um, other countries, but in archives or a font are the body of documentary records organically produced or gathered. My Zoom window is covering me up here. Uh, by a single agent, a person, organization, or corporation in the course of their regular activities and retained for the purposes of reference and research that is accessed, to, they're kept to be used. Um, this is not a formal definition that I got from anywhere. This is a Samantha special, as are most of the definitions in this uh, this webinar. Um, but they're, they're the documents people produce as they simply do their business and go about life. And we'll see some examples as we go through. Um, and that this, this translates into kind of the following conditions for us as we try to organize those records. Uh, one of the challenges that's, is that every single collection is going to be unique, and the locus of that uniqueness is in, of course, the creating entity, the source of those records. There will never is will never be another entity exactly like that one, and then thus follows from that that their individual records will also be unique. Uh, the minutes of one meeting are never going to be exactly like the minutes of another meeting or, or letter. Um, the order of the records is, will also be unique. So how, how that creating body um, kept them in sequence and in position to one another. So this means that an archival collection is more than the sum of its parts. And we will see um, a lot of examples of that, but it's not just uh, some things brought together. It's not just a list of things. Those things are related to one another. And it's also not um, naturally transparent to outsiders, what, what we would call researchers, um, because they weren't meant to be. They, they were uh, primarily created for people to do the things that they do in, in their ordinary life or business. People aren't thinking about an audience when they're creating these records. And so the archivist becomes the mediator. We become the kind of window on that collection. We translate for people to use those records later on, who, what's going on in this body of records and how, how can we help people navigate them? And all this means that archives are inherently tricky to organize and document for use. Another concept that will help us when we're trying to do that is original order, which you may or may not have heard of. And this is another definition that, that uh, I've kind of uh, cobbled together. Um, it's the organization of sequence or record, of records established by the records creator, whether intentionally or unintentionally, in the course of creating and using documents. And I've I've added this kind of bit that's important, what I think, uh, which itself constitutes information about how and why the records were created and used. So the way that the, the creator organize those records tells us something about not only the records, but about the creator. And it's not the same thing um, necessarily as how um, the material happens to be placed in whatever container you happen to get it in. So it's important to make that distinction. Um, you can see some examples there. Um, there are archivists often wryly say, oh, you know, original order people talk about it, but often it, it doesn't exist. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's it's not necessarily the same as juxtaposition, physical juxtaposition, but it can be. So in that pile on the right, um, there could be things together that are together for a reason, but that's the kind of thing that we need to analyze. It looks like a mess, but it, mm, there might be connections in there. On the left-hand side, we see files and envelopes. That's, that's a sign that, that people have gathered things together. 
whether the files are organized one after the other is something that you would need to analyze. And um, original order can be kind of cover the, the entire body of records. So you might find this in, in a government um, transfer of records or an accrual where you have a records management system and records are before they're even created. They are designed to be funneled and, and kept together in certain ways. And that you can see um, the files on the left indicate that that's what's going on. Those are government records um, under a records management uh, system. But you can also have little, what I call islands or pools of order. So say um, if you find material in an album, likely, not always, but likely the material in that album is, re is related. Or the pages of a single document, of course, are related to one another. They're, they're ordered in a certain way that's important or enclosures in a letter. So I think um, for me, something that's more uh, useful than the idea of uh, original order is um, the idea of archival bonds, which the uh, SAA glossary, archival glossary, in the case is a Canadian term, which I didn't realize. And that is uh, the network of relationships each record has with the records belonging um, together. And they're informational in themselves. So the mother of all archival bonds is the respect des fonds, which is um, the idea that all the records from one source, one creator are related to one another because that creator caused them to come into being. Um, and therefore they all tell us something about that creator's activities. It's important to realize that archival bonds can be invisible. What I mean by that is um, it made the only thing that indicates that the couple of records are related to one another is physical proximity. So say you have a, a photograph, which you can see there as an example, and inside a letter, it's an enclosure, and the photograph says me on the back. If that, if that photograph becomes disassociated from the letter, um, we have we have no idea who that is. If one if it's with the letter is a good chance that it's the letter writer. So there's an archival bond between that letter and the photograph. And that's kind of the thing, that, the things that we have to be aware of. Why do we arrange? Um, it's to establish the structure of body of records that we will end up describing. And it's, I've got my work cut out for me talking about um, arrangement and not going on to talk about description. Often you'll see arrangement and description as you know what, what archivists do, almost as if it's one word. You can read more about archival description at, um, on our blog. It's um, peelarchivesblog.com, and there's an article in there, um, How Do Archivists Describe Collections? Uh, there's a link there. I guess it won't do you much good on, on the webinar, but um, do check out our blog for more articles on archival basics. And then um, you're, you're also creating and clarifying um, what ends up being conceptual pathways to aid in navigation and understanding of those records. So you're creating groupings if there aren't any, and that aids efficient documentation of the collection and consultation. If you think of an archival collection that has thousands and thousands of pieces of paper, it's just not feasible to describe every single one or to list out every single one. And it wouldn't be terribly usable. There's no way to drill down and say, um, what do I find in this group of papers? And what do I find in this group of papers? And you will, while you're, while you're arranging, it'll be observing and preserving the uh, informative original order of records and constructing an order where one doesn't exist or partially exists. So your traditional archival processing flow tends to be um, appraisal. So you're figuring out, you know, what is appropriate to take into my collection, given my collection mandate, you're acquiring it uh, from a donor or by transfer if you're an organization. You, um, you take control of it by accessioning it, and then you arrange it, uh, and then you apply a description to that arrangement, put it away in storage, and then hopefully somebody uses it one day. I don't like the word processing myself. It's a funny thing I have. Um, to me, it sounds like a mechanical process. Uh, 
you know, you put something in one end of a meat grinder and you you kind of mindlessly do something to it and out pops your lovely arrangement. Um, in fact, I would like to suggest that that uh, processing itself is a process. It's it's inherently messy, and there's nothing wrong with you if you find it to be so. It involves uh, itself a process. It is a process itself, and um, with various tasks, which we will now look at. So now we're going to get into the uh, some of the, the practical matters. Whoops. And here I'm sort of taking as my assumption that you're go that you're that we're going to be th thinking of say a small to medium size collection. It's physical because a, a, a digital, especially born digital collection, is a whole different beast, and um, I can't address that in this webinar necessarily. And that it's non corporate, so it has to be into a, a records management um, system. So it's not pre classified for a, or pre, pre arranged in some way. And you're going to have some common overall steps. And uh, the green steps there, we're going to go on and talk about in more detail. But here's an overview. Um, I suggest that you begin by gathering the known information about the creator and their stuff. So if you've got a donor or creator to talk to, that's great. If they can tell you what, what's in there. Um, if you can get some reference materials, say a history of the business or an obituary of the person, something like that. Um, structure of previous accruals, if you had um, previous records, what, what do those archival descriptions look like? Perhaps they map, you can map onto those. Next, you want to make sure you have all the accruals in front of you when you're going to organize these records. Uh, sometimes in the real world, things come in in pieces, and the last thing you want is to do a nice arrangement and then find out, oh, here's another box. It happens more than you think. And then uh, you want to do um, an observational sweep of the whole collection, which we'll talk about in a bit more detail. And that will give you a basis on which you can gather the supplies you're going to need. So you're going to need space. You're going to need um, pencils, erasers, notebooks, cameras, um, sorting containers, archival housing, disassembly tools. And then you start sorting. And I'm using the word sorting purposely. Um, arrangement sounds like, um, you know, I've got to get it right the first time. This is a really serious thing. Really, you, you know, you're that's what you're you're event, you're starting out by sorting things, and you're going to have your sorting boxes and your sorting folders, which we'll look at. And eventually, uh, you keep sorting and sorting, and an arrangement emerges. It's really an emergent process. And when you complete it, you can pin it down in a description, which would, you know is outside of the scope of this particular webinar. So let's uh, talk about the observational suite, which I suggest you you do. Um, it's like if you're going to explore, you know, on, on a previously unexplored country, you kind of might send um, somebody ahead to look and see uh, what are we what are we dealing with here because then you're kind of for, forewarned this forearm. So what's the shape of the whole collection? Um, are there little islands of order that, that you can start with that you can see might be easy to see that those things are related? What are some problematic things I might need to deal with? And what supplies and spaces do I need? And so you would, I would suggest you poke around in each temporary container, which is often the way things come in, and note things. Um, as I've indicated there, and I strongly suggest that you take pictures. I still forget to do this, but it is one way of documenting the work, which when you're advocating um, for your work is essential. Pictures speak a thousand words. So if you can show like that this is labor and it's physical and it takes a long time and you show it various stages, that will hopefully help you. So you look at the types of, of documents that you're dealing with. Are they letters, albums, legal documents, et cetera? Um, the type of media, so paper, photos, um, film, whatever. 
broad date ranges, any potential for sensitive information or any conservation issues. Hopefully there's no mold, but you know, that's something you need to know about. And you look for small and large pools of order. And I'm calling that low hanging fruit because then you, you're sort of being told this, I've got to keep this stuff together. I know that right away. So here I've, I've indicated, you know, often order is, is visually evident, I'm finding. Um, so things like binders, sometimes there's just random stuff in it, but oftentimes there's a reason somebody kept that that stuff in, in one container. Envelopes, especially in the past, people used envelopes as essentially binders. They would write some, you know, reuse an envelope, which you have to be careful of because uh, to determine what on the envelope actually pertains to the stuff inside. Um, on the right, you can see, if you look carefully, there's tabs showing that this was once uh, ordered alphabetically. So you would need to reconstruct that. And uh, often visual repetitions. So say you have a bunch of binders and they're all the same color and size. Often that means there's something going on that people kept those records. It sounds simple, but um, I found that's often the case. So with arrangement, you've got a certain number of ta types of tasks you're doing. And um, I've kind of divided them into physically and intellect physical and intellectual tasks. And what you're doing physically is something that they often um, kind of don't, don't really talk about in school. What you're literally doing is making little piles. I um, mean, that's what you're doing. Um, if, you do, if you have space, that's, that's ideal. You don't have space, you can use boxes and folders, um, which you probably should start doing. It, this, it's a good time to start transferring things into archival housing. And uh, you are also scribbling on your boxes and folders or on pieces of paper on top of your piles, provisional categories or groupings. And I suggest while you're arranging, as I've just said, you, you start transferring things into use archival housing you would rehouse and stabilize very vulnerable materials. So if you find something that's falling apart, it's a good time to um, put it in you know, a stiff folder or something like that. And it's a good time to debulk materials. So um, get rid of those binders and divide them into folders, get rid of the frame. I mean, some people may disagree with this, but um, frames are acidic and scratch things up. So in my archives, we removed the frame. And it's a good time to do that. The intellectual tasks, you are noting and maintaining groupings and relationships that already exist. And we've talked about that. You're skimming and assessing what records are. Oftentimes it's not immediately um, obvious, but if you have that background on the creator, hopefully that will help you determine what things are. And you're grouping loose, unassociated records with like records. Now, what like means depends on the body of the records. And the records tell you how to group them. And, and kind of your job is to listen to the records and um, group them the way they indicate they should be grouped. And we're, we're going to see some examples. But... Um, Basically, the idea is to store things to store things when you can under a single heading, with with uh, you know some caveats on that that we'll get to, um, which will help and guide to, to guide the the researcher and create pathways to those records so that you don't have to list out every record. And you will probably, when you're doing this, find yourself creating larger groupings and then splitting them up. Uh, if you find that, oh, this naturally falls into um, different groups, such as, you know, by date or, or something like that, or you can consolidate smaller groups. It's very much an iterative process, and that's kind of a jargony word now, but basically the decisions you make will depend on the prior decisions you make. The things you're finding, you will build on as you go through the process, and that is completely normal, and that's what it's all about, really. And these groupings will eventually become files in your archival description. And you can eventually group those and form series, depending on kind of uh, how big the collection is and, and what works. And very, very um, dependent on the collection. 
just checking the time here. So let's look at an example. Um, so this is um, a collection I'm embarrassed to say I've, I've been working on for a long time. It's not particularly big, but um, such is life uh, where I work. <laughs> um, it's a family farming family that uh, somewhat poignantly lived on the farm or what was the it used to be a farm but it's the lot that we ended up living on in a subdivision when we came to Canada and so it's a bit of a bookend for me um, in my career and uh, feels big so it's a little bit of a coincidence it came in in, in chunks um, the donor is in her late 90s and she moved into a retirement home so she's been handing things over as, as she finds them. And so I did talk to her, um, got family names, family lore, what the lots of land are, their occupations, associations they were in, um, dates they were active. So we have uh, the box on the left, which is a hodgepodge of things. We have a, a strong box up there at the top, the tin box. And we have a box, the only box that had a label on it uh, is the one at the bottom and it had Aunt May's papers on it. Um, and she was the aunt of the donor who was an aspiring commercial artist, but also produced sketches of the area before it was, um, before it was basically a subdivision. So that's very um, unusual for us to have. And so uh, when I did my inspection of this, um, the, the strong box is mostly you know, things that you would expect that people had um, kept in a safe place, so legal documents, some letters that, that seemed to be important uh, to them, a few photographs. Uh, the box on the left, um, there were photograph albums. You can see some files there, albums we can expect to be little islands of order. There's a file there, it may or may not be similar material on the file. That's something we'd have to look at. The sketchbooks form a group, um, the drawings form a group that was came in that way. And this is what sorting basically looks like. Um, this is what arranging looks like. So on the left there, that's just the contents of the metal box. And you can see that's not very much stuff, but it is a space intensive type of work when you're trying to figure out what things are and what might go together. And you can, to save space, use um, boxes and files as, as I'm doing up at the top there. And I found uh, just lying around the office, these sort of wire frames that um, they stagger the files. So you can see your kind of provisional grouping labels as you're going along. So I find that useful. I just want to show you an example of um, two containers that one which I treated, I did not treat as an example of original order, and one that I did treat as an example of original order, and another archivist may disagree with me, and uh, we could have that discussion. But uh, there was this um, sort of wallet that said valuable papers on it. And in the wallet, there, there were kind of bound in envelopes with lots of records in them. And there were no labels or writing within that little wallet. Other than there being valuable papers, I didn't see a reason to sort of create a file called valuable papers and stick them all in. So I found that they, they fell into to groups, um, the donor school records, which went pretty far back, um, some household records, her husband's, um, papers. He was in the army and uh, discharged from, for, for illness. And then some um, land records. So I found that those, those were easily grouped with kind of loose records in the rest of the donation. And that made things more coherent. So I found, for instance, her diplomas from nursing school. And I, I grouped all her kind of educational records together. Same with um, domestic records. There were other domestic records that I grouped in with the household records. On the right-hand side um, is a Victorian photograph album, um, her, her ancestors. And these types of albums often, the, um, the, the kind of uh, 
joining the, the, the cardboard in between the pictures tends to come apart. They're highly acidic. So even though they're aesthetically cool, uh, we do take them apart, I'm afraid. And each photograph had uh, it was an annotation of who it was. And they were kind of roughly grouped in families. So in that case, the order is important. So I numbered um, the photographs in order and put them in the you know, kind of enclosure we had at the time and wrote the name of the um, person depicted on the, uh, the enclosure. Now there are some limits. I, I said, you know, with arrangement, you're, you're kind of grouping like records with like. There are some limits that you have to be careful. Um, so here, here you can see there are various types of maps and plans in this collection. On the left-hand side, there's maps and plans in an envelope of estate papers. In the middle, there's drawings that um, she and her son did as part of the school project he did on local history. And on the right-hand side, um, this was with a pile of land records, no longer clear which, um, they, which land deed they went with. They were kept for separate reasons. So I didn't take all those plans and put them in a plan file. So the, the uh, one on the left was kept in that envelope, um, which indicates what, how those records in that envelope are related. The local history maps went with local history papers. And um, the ones on the right um, had were in a file of, um, of land boundary sketches. And um, on the left there, you can see how how just how rough my my sorting folders look. I mean, they're not uh, they're, they're really rough. They start out rough rough categories, and uh, you can keep clumps of records together in one file if you kind of separate them out. Here I'm using buffered paper to keep that these are all estate records, but dealing with different estates as the envelopes that the records came in indicate. So I'm making sure to keep those clumps together, but in such a way as that they can both be, they can all be in one file of you know, settled, estate settlement records. Don't be afraid to have a uh, temporary, um, I don't know what the heck this is folder. You can deal with that kind of after the fact, and you may find that you know as you go further in your arrangement, it becomes clear where you can pop those I don't know what the heck they are things. There's some other examples of subjective decisions there. Um, I do, because we're a local history archives, we do tend to um, call out certain records by having them be the only thing in a file, and because we know that certain things are going to be pulled a lot because of our researcher base. So uh, I made the decision, there's um, an immigration ticket there uh, from 1819 that uh, it's, it's also very fragile. So I wanted to keep it kind of isolated by itself and I stabilized it. On the right um, is a file that I made. It, it's um, brought together cards by uh, the, the teacher. Uh, he was a local artist and taught Aunt May. And I put that together with some clippings um, that were found in the collection about him. And it comes a sort of topical file. So this is uh, what, how things are looking now. And I unfortunately haven't finished. Um, so this is not a start to finish thing for you, but um, and I don't, obviously you probably can't read all that, but the blue um, files are files that I put together kind of artificially from loose records. And the green, they're not, they're, these aren't file titles yet. They're getting there. Um, the green groupings are ones that came in grouped that way by the, the donor. And the white, um, the white items are things I'm going to keep in their own file for, for reasons that I, I mentioned about um, there being a wide interest to our, to our user group. Could I split some of these up? Yes. Could I group some of these together? Yes. So well, some of that is depends on kind of your institution and the way you know records are used. And then you will find uh, if you're using your archival folders, you're using your eraser a lot and you know changing your um, your grouping notes, 
eventually you'll, you'll more or less end up with a finished archival collection. You can consolidate the files so that you don't use up too much space in the box and, and you can write your description. Okay, so um, I've put together some frequently asked questions um, that I can imagine um, you might want to ask. And one of them is what are some common groupings or record types? I'm not going to read out everything there, but um, there, you know, just because people are people, <laughs> their their records tend to fall in certain certain common groups. So, with, with um, individuals or organizations, correspondence is obviously you know interacting with other people in a recorded manner is a common thing to do. Financial records are common. Organizational and, and individuals are obviously a little bit different. Um, with organizations, you'll have minutes and. and you know, legal records that are different from legal records and personal um, collections. If you are from an institution that tends to deal with um, a certain type of business, you may have a kind of prescribed arrangement plan that is suggested. So on the right there uh, is is what the American um, Archives of American Art, which I believe is the Smithsonian, suggests for their artist files. But they do also say, of course, every collection is unique. So this is a place to start. And uh, we like it to be organized in this way if you can. But this is kind of the way artists tend to work. So it's, 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 uh, it's still an example of kind of the records telling us how to organize them themselves in a way. And I suggest that you actually look at their processing guide online. They have the most a detailed processing guide I've ever seen. So um, there's a lot of, you know, it's very house specific to the way they do things, but um, you can learn a lot too. How granular do I get with my files? I, as I've said, that that kind of depends on your your practices and your workload capacity because every file will will need a description. So remember that. And um, when do I use series or groups of files? Again, that depends. Um, some archives won't use series if the collection is below a certain volume. Um, it, it depends, you know, think of the user. Will it help them? Do you have the capacity to write another level of descriptions? Sometimes you can effectively create series by putting in the file titles um, a similar sort of um, description for a, for a group of records. So you can have correspondence in, in all the file titles and it will effectively create a series without you having to, to create another description level. What can you call? Uh, typically we call duplicates of published material, which are probably out there somewhere um, existing. Um, voluminous reference material depends People have printed out stuff, tons of stuff from the internet when they're doing some research, might not want to keep all that. Um, I think it's something with very low informational value. So once I found in a collection a, a bag full of um, Frisky's cat food receipts from you know, one of our supermarkets, um, not a whole lot of you know, archival space costs, right? So you have to think about um, the cost benefit analysis of keeping things like that and whether it tells us anything. And then large amounts of material outside your collecting mandate, which hopefully would have, um, when you were doing the appraisal for collection, you would have, you would have filtered those out, but sometimes that doesn't happen. Um, should I try to repair archival bonds or restore vestigial or original order? That's a difficult question. You may find that happening, that happens as a result of sorting. I've had brought things together. Oh, you know, these are two halves of the same thing. Um, and it depends how much time you have and how critical the order is to understanding the records. So sometimes it's just not worth trying to figure out. And you just describe what you've got in front of you and you can write a note saying that this is what, what you did. There's usually in archival descriptions, you can have a an archi archivist's note. Um, an elephant in the room. Um, so I have, whoops, I have uh, assumed that you're able to handle every, if not every item, every file. 
archivists are increasingly strapped for time. And uh, it has, you know, in, in 2005, somebody kind of brought this out to the forefront with um, a paper called More Product, Less Process, where they talk about describing things at the box level. Um, but really, archivists have been having levels of processing for a long time. We don't necessarily lavish the same attention on every single collection. And that's something that you would you know, discuss in, in, in the context of your institution. But if you want to see what, what uh, one archives has done with those different um, levels of processing, kind of different going, only going so far with the processing, you can look again at the uh, Archives of American Art at their processing um, guide online and, and, and see how, what they recommend for those you know, different levels. So summary um, of advice. I strongly suggest you document the process before and after uh, and throughout with photos. I still forget to do that, but um, it's a good idea. And you should move cautiously at first. Um, you don't want to, once two things come apart and uh, you may not, you may never be able to reconstruct that. And um, take notes as you can, especially if you get interrupted a lot, which most of us do. Um, I was once told you should always make notes such that if you, you know, leave or um, something happens to you that somebody else can take over. I haven't found that realistic. There just isn't time to take notes to that degree, but notes to yourself about, you know, I got this far and I did it for this reason are always helpful. Again, let the records speak to you and follow their lead, informed by um, common practices. Always, uh, you know, consult with colleagues. Um, I, I still do that um, for tricky things. Look at what other archivists have done with descriptions, because that will help you with arrangement. Be prepared to keep revising your categories and groups. Um, but, you know, once you come up with something that works, um, try to avoid kind of backtracking and too much agonizing. And watch, for, again, watch for those subtle archival bonds, but um, don't get paralyzed. Um, it's more important to you know get the stuff out there to use in the end. Always think about the user because that's ultimately what you're doing this for. And you can always explain your reasoning in an in a arrangement or this note. So basically uh, you can do anything as long as you, well, not anything, but a lot of, you can get away with a lot as long as you explain um, how you found it and what you decided to do. And sometimes there isn't a right decision, there's just a decision. And there is such a thing as good enough, which, you know, we tend to be perfectionists, but again, um, document, any kind of documentation and getting it ready for use is a good thing. So tend to draw on some skills that it's, it's difficult to find, uh, to sort of get together, but, um, you're gonna to have to be risk averse and yet uh, make tough decisions. You're gonna to have to do justice to the records, but also to the user. You're gonna to have to skim things quickly and assess what things are quickly but accurately. And you're gonna to have to hold a lot of stuff in your short-term memory, which you could probably tell. Um, I don't know if we should stop for some questions or, or go on. Um, I'm just good. I have these sort of finishing up slides about um, things that don't quite fit into the mid-size physical collection. So what do our moderators think? Should I continue? Uh, I We have about 10 questions and some of them are pretty good. Would you like to take questions? It's up to you, Samantha. I'm um, sure, let's, let's try. Okay. I have a collection of church records with over four boxes that were labeled miscellaneous by the donor. Is it okay to break groups out of this to facilitate research? Yeah, miscellaneous is one of those things that we all dread. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> it doesn't tell you anything. And um, it could be that that was their impression when, when they put the box together. But in fact, there are groupings in there. Um, so you're talking about providing, I guess this person's talking about providing access before it's arranged. I would probably put some kind of flag in there if you're going to do that. Mm -hmm. It's like it came from this place in the box. 
And you want to make sure if you, you know, subject to any legislative um, requirements, you know, privacy and that sort of thing, yeah. that you vet things that you're providing access to. Mm -hmm. um, another question, H how strictly should you adhere to original order? I have a music collection, creator organized by composer, but not alphabetically. Arranging alphabetically may be helpful. Do I just arrange intellectually that way and leave the physical arrangement in the original mixed order? Um, can you read the first part again? How strictly should you adhere to original order? Yeah, sorry, um, just after that. I, I have a music collection, creator organized by composer, but not alphabetically. Hmm. So I guess what you'd like to know uh, how strict is religion uh, original? Yeah, it's you know I, I know it's annoying, but I just want to say it depends again. Um, it depends how how that if that original order tells you something that um, if 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 it goes away, you're going to miss. And um, it's 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 certainly true that sometimes we don't um, organize the records in the way the person did so themselves, but at the very least, if you did that, you'd want to make a note that this was originally uh, organized in a different way. Um, but if it, if there's any, if that, if that's going to cause an information loss, I would be cautious. Good. Okay, here's another one, because you mentioned notes. When taking notes, what are the highest level notes that you take? How detailed are you in keeping series descriptions to be clear and concise? Um, series descriptions. Well, there's a whole like description is a whole um, other thing that um, you know, it could be a webinar as well. You're not supposed to kind of repeat information. There's a whole you know rubric for describing things. Notes by notes, I mean notes to sell. When, when you're arranging, this is this is what I did this day. So I removed this from here. I got this box done. I noticed there was this issue. Uh, it's, it's kind of to remind you of where you got and what you did because I have the experience of coming back to something months later, I'm sorry to say, and just not remembering uh, why I did, you know, why I did what I did and, um, sort of the, the the basis for it. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, the notes for a description are, uh, hopefully you might might get some um, answers in, in the blog post I mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, Here's a question that's somewhat related in terms of art. <laughs> Is there a process for arranging archival objects that are acquired in addition to archival records? Does this process follow the same rules as for archival records, or is there a different set of rules to follow when arranging archival objects alongside archival records? Hmm. Yeah, that's um, that's again, it's sort of, well, I suppose that's description. Um, we don't tend because I'm in uh, an institution with a museum, we tend to hype off the ar uh, artifacts to the museum oh, and then well, cross link them and uh, try to avoid collecting artifacts. But yeah, I suppose you could have a series or something, um, but you would want to create that documentation that there's a link between, say, um, a, an object and a document. This is a short, short question, but how do you generally handle duplicates while processing? Um, because you know you can have a duplicate it's easier to have a duplicate if something's published because there's more than one you know if it's printed um it's not so common to have uh duplicates of completely unique things or the, i suppose minutes um that are born digital or something people people could print out multiple copies we tend to try to keep duplicates down because because they take up space depends on rarity too um if there's um, yeah. if it's published but uh it's very rare uh, you might want to keep two or something, but you wouldn't want to keep, you know, a box of them or something. <laughs> um, uh, here's another one. Do you take photos out of albums and put them in what looks like paper sleeves? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, because uh, photo albums tend to be very aesthetic, especially the sticky kind where, you know, they have oh, sticky yes. packing and, yeah. Here's another one about digital records. Have you encountered arranging digital records? 
if so, how did you approach us, especially with digital records in large quantities? That's yeah, hard. that that's another. As I said, that's a that's a whole beast. Um, <laughs> there, there, there's an argument. You know, I, I'm not an expert in this um, or a theorist, but some argue that there's no arrangement to be done with digital records, believe it or not, um, because they are mm -hmm. they come in files. And one person said, you just take somebody's hard drive and that's it. That that's a thing, and uh, you don't you don't arrange it. Um, yeah, that that could be another webinar. I think. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I've got a question for you, and it was an article I read about archival intelligence, and it seems to me that you've, you've really made that point in uh, your remarks. So would you be able to make a, a comment on archival intelligence and the experience you have so that you can make decisions? So that the mindset is kind of... Uh, no, well, it's, it's a capacity. I mean, yeah, and, I mean, I, I think if, if we go back to, um, let me see... Did I say something about, um, sorry about this. That's okay. Yeah, I mean, I, th I guess I thought of it as skills, but I'm you sorry. have to, you have to have a, uh, an ability to see the forest and also the trees <laughs> and, and to, um, kind of get to know somebody through their, the traces they've left behind. And you kind of make friends with the collection and, and you make friends with them almost. Yeah. This is another photo question. Do you ever retain any original photo albums after you remove the photographs just mm. for historical value? It depends, <laughs> as I keep saying. Um, they can't have our, they can't have artifactual value. If there's any kind of inscriptions or annotations, that's a much stronger case. If it if it looks cool, uh that's we're kind of veering away from that now we might ask the museum if they want it more often than not they say no especially if there's no you know it doesn't inform the local kind of context but certainly if there are annotations and also if you can't if you did if it's going to destroy the album to take it apart scrapbooks yeah. are especially bad this way you just you can't unglue all the stuff so you have to keep it the way it is well, we do have one last question. And uh, since you've got your slides up, the person asked, "Would I would love to see the visual pathway of real life processing again. Can you go back to that slide? Yeah, sorry. This is a disadvantage of using the animation. That one or that one? Let's see. <laughs> oh, no, real. It said, she said real oh, life real processing. One. Yeah. yeah. They'd like to see that again. And there is one more question. I know we're almost out of time. Um, oh dear. <laughs> I'm a processing professors, I'm processing a professor's course course information. Would it be better to process them chronologically, alphabetically, or other ways? So it's a professor's coursework. Hmm. Uh does, is that like student work, I wonder? Or um well, I think when you're just talking about course information, it's probably syllabus, tests. Yeah. Um, uh, ways of grading. Um, yeah, I can follow up my course. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, it could be, that's the thing. Sometimes there's, there is no right answer. Uh, there's yeah. just uh, what, what you did and, and, yeah, and we have one minute left. clear what you did. Ah, uh, yeah. And it, and it depends if there's information loss, whichever way you treat, you want to minimize any kind of information loss. But, but people can, two archivists can do things in different ways. Okay. Um, I guess that's it with our with our questions and answers. And uh, I don't know if Mary Grace is going to come up again, but I just thought your presentation was excellent. The slides were excellent. And I want to thank you so much. Oh, uh, and somebody you. else is saying that. Uh, thank you very much. It was very helpful. So I think you did a great job, Samantha. And, okay. and I think we'll be all looking forward to seeing the YouTube, um, uh, the, the YouTube video. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, we didn't get to some of the uh, sort of more problematic things like big collections and collections that grow, but um, that's okay. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's yeah. That's a whole another. That's a whole another topic. Yeah. No, they could be. Yeah. yeah well, here we are at time. It's three o'clock. 
Okay, thank you great. So much. You've got a whole line of people saying thank you to you, Samantha. <laughs> so I think people really enjoyed it. Okay, I'm glad. Okay, well, God bless you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye.